Court, member of the board here at the library. We are delighted that you're here. Um, just a couple of preliminaries and a brief introduction of our speaker. First, uh, I'd love to remind people when we, when we meet here that I recently saw an article that said, there are more public libraries than Starbucks cafes. <laughs> How's that? And uh, uh, nearly 100% have of which have Wi-Fi and no free access to computers. There were 113 million attendees at public library programs in 2016, more than all Major League Baseball, football, and basketball games combined. How's that? So, you're, so we're delighted that you're part of the group of attendees here at the uh, Crawford Public Library. I want to also uh, acknowledge the presence of the president of our board, Lynn Skolnick, who's there, and another member of the board, Connie Keller, Kyle Keller, uh, and I think that's what I wanted to do. Um, I would ask a favor, if you haven't already, silence your phones, please. And uh, a couple of small plugs. One is, we apologize if you had any difficulty getting in. The parking lot is being set up for our book festival on Saturday from 10 to 4. There will be um, readings, authors, and books for sale. All at county libraries. All at county libraries. So what we've cordoned off is probably not even going to begin, hopefully, to cover how many people are going to be here, but we hope you'll join us. Rain or shine, right? It, it rain or shine. And if they're here on Saturday, please park behind the um, Bagel Bakery. This, and there's, you know, nicely um, <coughs> renewed steps that right. come down right into our, our library space. So, and what um, we used to call Oakley be. Avenue, right? Yeah. Back, back that away. Okay. The other is if I could put in a plug for the Friends of the Crawford Library, which is very important to what we do. And we would appreciate if you care to join us. Seniors are $5, otherwise membership is 10. And they do a lot of things to help support the library. And it's a wonderful cause. And there are these forms that are outside, uh, in addition to forms for you to sign after the program on how you liked it and whether you have any suggestions or what have you. Um, tonight, I'm delighted to welcome a friend, <laughs> a longtime friend, uh, Steve Sharif, to the podium. For those who don't know, Steve was born and raised here in Monticello. His dad was the chief of police for <coughs> the years. 33. 33, okay, I was close. Um, Steve was born and raised here in Monticello, went to the Monticello schools, has several degrees. I don't want to steal his thunder, so I'll let him tell you. Uh, not the least of which was uh, the time that he spent at Kent State, which he's going to talk about. He's traveled all over the world and actually lived in a number of countries. I suspect he may tell us a little bit about that. And I won't give it away. And like Denise and myself, move back home to Monticello at some point after this travel. And uh, because his roots are here, and because this is what he cares about, he spent his time here in the community, uh, including spending several years working at Bosey's in, uh, in Liberty. He teaches at the current time an online course in history, and uh, right from his home. So but he's got students all over the country. Um, Steve's going to tell us his story, and I don't want to steal his thunder. I think you're in for a treat, and I want us to welcome Steve Sharp. Thank you. Well, let me first apologize. I have this down at 6 30, so I have to say that at the beginning. I don't, I don't know why, but that's how I have it down. In any event, um, what Marvin has asked me to do is really an impossibility. He basically asked me to speak about my life, which is intertwined with the world and the United States for two decades. It's not possible to do that. It is possible if you're taking a course. So everything that is involved in these de decades, I have taught. Um, the second thing is a little vignette that I've always told my students. And that is, you will understand a lot about the United States if you understand that the basis of the United States is a white, Anglo-Saxon, conservative, Christian country. If you start out with that process, then you will understand a lot of what happens in American history. The, the function of a historian, for me, is to try to give you 
a point of view. And it's a particular point of view. Um, anybody who stands in front of you in a classroom or any kind of settings and tell you they don't have an opinion is not telling you the truth. People pretty much have an opinion about everything. No matter what it is, no matter what their opinions are. They have them. And I have my own opinions um, that I pass along to my students the way my major professors pass their opinions along to me. And you can accept them or you cannot accept them. That is a, a cause of free will. You know, you're talking about, in these decades, you're talking about history, you're talking about political science, you're talking about sociology, okay? you're talking about psychology. You're talking about every kind of ology that you can think of when you do this. So I wanted to show you um, two pictures. I, I thought about this pretty much the whole day and really what I wanted to do. And uh, I thought it would be a good idea to show you two pictures of kind of, of my life. So I printed them out. And you can see um, the, this picture, Marvin told me that he actually took this picture. This picture was taken in 1973. I am on the far uh, left. 69. 69. That was 69. Okay. So I wanted, to, I wanted you to see this. That's, yeah, that's Michael. That's the guy there that's facing is one of my closest friends, Michael's cousin who lives in Berlin. This is a picture that was taken in 1977. Yeah, go right ahead. Okay. <laughs> and you'll get a kick out of it. Now, obviously, I have a reason for showing you this, for showing you just the transformation, my transformation. Keep, keep going around if you would. I'd like the folks to get to see this side. I actually should have made two copies of this. Okay. So in any event, Marvin Sawyer, I, I was born and raised in Monticello. My father was the police chief for 33 years. It was not easy. It was not easy for me, nor was it easy for my brother. My entire family was here in Monticello. Both the sheriffs and the Rubens. All here since 1909, when my great uncle, Abraham Rubin came to work for Willie Cooper. That last name, some of you will know, I'm sure. Greg Cooper is a grandson in Monica Valley. And I went to school here, and I was not a good student. Um, I, didn't, I didn't like being uh, tied up in a classroom. Um, I wanted to be outside. But one of the things I did like, and my entire family, which many who were uneducated, formally uneducated, read. I loved to read. And that, I saw my parents read, I saw my aunts and uncles read. So when I went to school here, and I went to a class like math, I would put a book in front of my math book, which is why I failed geometry three times. <laughs> it's true. Three times. Three times. But hated it. Wanted to be outside. You know, when you have, a, you have a, a life, you make small decisions. They're very small at the time. And what they turn into many times is life decisions. And that's kind of what happened to me. Okay. So I got out of school here, and as a poor student, I went to Orange County Community College. And with some illness and some other things, I was actually pushed into the generation of the 1960s. I'm 75. I don't really belong in that generation. I'm a little too old for that generation. But I was pushed into that generation because of some things that happened to me. And because my grades were so so, I wound up at the State University of New York, State University of New York at Plattsburgh, New York, which changed my life. My daughter went to graduate school at Harvard, and I can tell you that I got as good as education at the State University of New York at Plattsburgh as she got at Harvard. And I've had that discussion with her. And part of that, we have those pictures, please. Remember their name? Part of, part of that is because I had a guy that became interested in me as a person and a historian. His name is Dave Glazer. He is my closest friend to this day. I met him in 1965. I was an older student. He was a young professor. And I loved, he knew I loved history. My father liked history. Took me all up and down the eastern seaboard so I could see all these things, my brother and I, and I loved it. And David said to me from the beginning, he said, I want you to know there are no jobs. He said, I know you want to teach college. He said, I understand. You know, he said, but there are no jobs. And I said, I don't care. 
And I told my parents that. When I came home, I said to my parents, I don't care. I don't care this job. This is what I love, and my parents were great. Those of you who knew my family, and there are people in here who knew my family, you know, that's the way my parents were. They were incredibly supportive of both my brother and myself in doing what we wanted to do. So I went up to the State University of New York in Plattsburgh, and I graduated from there in 1967. And um, in 1967, I then got into uh, an Austin Healey 3000, if those of you who know cars at all, which is a little sports car, with two of my friends, and we traveled all over the United States to California, with one of us taking turns sitting in the back over here and two front seats, you know, as far as we like. Um, I came back uh, in 1968 and um, did a variety of things, and in 1969, I went to graduate school at Kent State University. Um, I wanted to stay in Plattsburgh. Dave Glazier did not want me to stay in Plattsburgh. He said, you need to go somewhere else. So I wound up at Kent State University and got involved in what happened there. Let me, let me stop for a minute with that piece of it and tell you that it's very difficult to kind of put these pieces together and how to do this because I'm talking about myself, but I'm also talking about the 1960s and the 1970s. And these are just, uh, today, just sitting and thinking, this is kind of what I just typed out about, about Vietnam and the student movement and you know everything, with feminism, everything that was going on in those years because it was enormous. The changes that were happening were enormous in this country. And, and we still feel them. We're feeling, we're feeling the effects of a lot of those changes. In any event, um, I'm at Kent State University really pretty apolitical. Um, David was very political. I picked up some of his politics. My parents were not particularly political. I would say, while they were fairly liberal with us, they were on the conservative side, um, but not the kinds of conservatives we see today. The other kinds of conservatives that existed in the Republican Party and Sullivan County at that point, for those of you who have been here any length of time, was Republican. And um, the conservatives were different at that point. My parents were different at that point. In any event, I went up at Kent State fairly apolitical. And what I ran into there was a large number of very, very political students, both undergraduate students and graduate students. And I got there just in time for the real craziness to start in the United States. I think you have to remember, and this is the whole historical part of all of this. You have to remember what transpired from the end of the Second World War until the 1970s. This is, this is a really important historical thing because at the end of the Second World War, the world had changed inexorably. The United States became the only power standing in the world. Okay? Yes, there was the Soviet Union, but the Soviet Union was very backwards. The Soviet Union had lost, I forgot how many millions of people between the, the winters and between the fighting the Germans. Okay? And I thought the number, but there was like 30 million, it's, it's an enormous number of people that they lost. So the end of the war leaves the United States as the sole power in the world. The goal of the United States at the end of the war, and you see it in the UN, you see it in the Marshall Plan, you see it in the formation of data, you see it in the formation of CETA, military alliances. The goal is to have a world that is peaceful and controlled by the United States and its allies. That's the goal, a peaceful world. Pax Americana, like it was a Pax Romana. And the United States goes out of its way to formulate how they're going to do this, with the understanding that they have an arch enemy. And that arch enemy is the Soviet Union. And so they have to figure out in this country how they're going to deal with the Soviet Union. And a very famous man by the name of George Kennan put, puts forth a policy in 1947, I believe, called containment. 
in which he basically said, what we're going to do is we're going to contain the Soviet Union. We're going to use this methodology, these economics and these military strategies and organization to contain the Soviet Union in its place, which is where NATO comes in. <coughs> the other issue that is going to come about is also China. You have to remember that there is a civil war that has gone on in China for many, many years. It is the nationalists and Chiang Kai-shek and Mao Zedong and the communists. Okay? Chiang Kai-shek loses, despite massive aid from the United States, he loses. He loses because he is corrupt. He loses because Mao knows how to deal with the people. Mao knows what they need. Mao feeds them. Mao is kind to them. Chiang's troops are horrible. They rape, they pillage, they do everything they shouldn't do. So we have a situation with China, and we have a situation with the Soviet Union. In 1949, now, King Chiang Kai-shek is done. The United States then turns on itself and says, who's to blame for this? Who's to blame for the fall of China? And these fingers are pointing each other, pointing at each other. The Democrats are to blame, the Republicans are going to blame, the liberals are to blame, the conservatives are to blame. Who's to blame? And what happens, and this is a very important point, what happens is, the people in the State Department who know the most about Asia leave the department. So that when it comes to Vietnam, there is no one to say in the State Department, shouldn't do this. This is the history of Vietnam, which I'll tell you a little bit about. This is the history of Vietnam, and you really shouldn't do this because of everything that's happened there. There's nobody there in the American government that's going to say that. Let's go to Vietnam for a moment and talk a little bit about that. Starting in the 1900s, in the 18th, 19th century, the French become involved in what is French Indochina. It's Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos. And it's that whole piece that winds up when you look at it down. It's kind of a curvature like this. The French are one of the strong colonial powers in the world. The French and the British are the two strongest. And the French become involved in Indochina. During the, now, now, remember, there's wars now, the First World War, the Second World War. During the Second World War, the Japanese take over Indochina. But the Chinese have a lot of influence in the north. And the French have a lot of influence in the south. When the war is over, the British are in the south as part of the Allied forces. The French come back into Indochina. This was a major error on the part of the United States because the United States allowed that to happen. And the rationale behind it, you can understand what the rationale is. The rationale behind it is what I told you to begin with. What the United States wanted <coughs> was a peaceful world controlled by its, itself and its allies, and they wanted a trade conglomeration. They wanted to make, what we did for Europe, we didn't do because of, the, out of just the goodness of our heart. We did it to set up a capitalist system. That was the idea behind all this. The Europeans knew this. This was no, no great secret. And so, I just lost my train of thought. Um, French, Indochina. Capitalism. No, it's okay. It, it, happens, it happens sometimes. Well, so so basically, basically you have you have a situation where Chinese communists and Soviet Union come. Oh, the French. Okay, the French come back. The French come back into, into China because the United States wants their help, along with the help of the British, in containing the communists. So they allow them to come into Indochina. At the end of the Second World War, a very famous man, famous there, not famous here, Ho Chi Minh, mm -hmm. was the head of what became the Viet Cong, later became the Viet Cong, it was the, it was the People's Republic uh, Party. And at the end of the war, he chose the Constitution of the United States as a model for the Constitution of Vietnam. Needless to say, he was shocked and disappointed 
that the Americans allowed the French to come back in. And a civil war started in Vietnam. And that civil war was between the French and the Vietnamese, particularly Ho Chi Minh's people. The French got trapped in a place called Dien Bien Phu in Vietnam. It was a valley surrounded by mountains. There were paratroopers there, French paratroopers, elite paratroopers there. The French figured that there was no way that they could have any harm come to them there because they had overwhelming power, but they didn't count on it. The United States neglected to think about in their part in the Vietnam War was how pugnacious the Vietnamese were. They took apart artillery pieces and they carried them on their backs over the mountains. And they started raining down fire on the French at the end of the end vote, to the point that they, were, they actually asked um, Truman, Eisenhower, Eisenhower, to drop an atomic bomb. And he refused. All this, by the way, all of this stuff, you can research, you can look it up. He absolutely refused. At that point, the French left Indochina and the Americans came in. That was the beginning of the Vietnam War for the United States. The real beginning. And it starts just about when John Kennedy becomes president. So you see, all of this is really tied together. It's like two decades now, a decade and a half of this war. So you have, you have the Vietnam War that's going on, which, which basically shapes everybody of my generation, one way or another, because of the draft, right? The draft. Everybody, some of you are too young, but most of you understand. You signed up for the draft when you were 18. You had a choice. You got drafted, or you went into the military. There was no, I'm not going to do it. There was no, nah, I'm, you know, I'm doing something else. There was none of that. It was expected that you would do that. That's what everyone did. Then came Vietnam, and everything that happened in Vietnam, and it's a lot. And people started saying, I'm not doing that. I'm not going to the draft. I mean, you know, this, is a, this war is nuts. So, you know, I have like all of these things in like a five hour class. Um, so they part Vietnam, I told you, Vietnam is partitioned, you know, and, and what happens basically in, but the, the war that's happening in Vietnam, in 1954 they decide to partition Vietnam into the North and South. With the communists in the North, and uh, a government supported by the United States in the South. And what happened is that the United States decides to make a Catholic the president of Vietnam. Vietnam is not a Catholic country. Okay? <laughs> not a Catholic country. And they happen to make a man who's very disliked, but then no Diem Die as president. He is eventually assassinated. All right? John Kennedy becomes president in 1960. You see, you see, this all revolves around these very big things that happen, and Vietnam is the one of the major, if not the major issue. John Kennedy becomes president. He gets a lot of advice, a lot of different kinds of advice, but before he can do anything about Vietnam, comes Cuba. Yeah. All right, and I'm sure all of us remember about the Bay of Pigs. Okay, something that he really gave very, very bad advice. Okay, Bay of Pigs is a failure. Then comes the Cuban Missile Crisis. We all remember that, I'm sure. We're old enough to remember that, and what happened with all of that. And Khrushchev stepping back, that's an interesting story, by the way, just a small vignette, is that Khrushchev wrote a very bold, bellicose letter to John Kennedy. And Kennedy wasn't sure to answer during the height of this crisis. His brother Bobby said to him, make believe you never got the letter. <laughs> this is true. Make believe you never got the letter, don't answer the letter, write a different letter back. And that's what he did. He wrote a different letter back to Khrushchev. And eventually, as you know, think this thing got settled. Kennedy is actually the one who really upped the ante in the Vietnam War. 
he started sending in advisors. Okay? These advisors became more and more. They initially went in to advise the Vietnam, Vietnamese military. As they started to put troops in, the United States, the United States had advisors, they put troops in to help protect the advisors. They had an airfield. They put troops in to protect the airfields. You have an escalation, a continual escalation in Vietnam. Kennedy is assassinated. Lyndon Johnson becomes president. Lyndon Johnson is perhaps one of the most interesting men to ever hold the presidency in this country. He is a phenomenally interesting man. To begin with, he's huge. He's a very, very big man. He spent a lot of time in Congress, he was speaker, and he would give what they call the Johnson treatment. And he'd stand over someone, because he's big, and he'd poke him in the chest <laughs> like this, like this, and look down at them. You can read, all this stuff is readable. If you like any of it, look it up, it's all readable. And that's what he would do, like this. Okay. Like Woodrow Wilson, in World War I, what Johnson hoped for in his presidency was domestic policy, was to be a great domestic leader, the great society. That's what Woodrow Wilson wanted from his presidency. Neither of them got it. What Johnson got was a war. Okay? That's what he got. And a lot of it was his own fault. He knew how bad the M was. And what he said about the M was, the M is a son of a bitch, but he's our son of a bitch. That's what he said. It was our son of a bitch. And they kept putting more and more men into Vietnam. Lyndon Johnson, Doris Kearns Goodwin wrote a book about Lyndon Johnson. She used to come at night and sit on the corner of his bed and talk to him about all this. Lyndon Johnson personally chose the targets that the American Air Force was going to hit in Vietnam, personally. Personally, presidents don't do this, but he did. Because he saw his legacy wrapped <coughs> up in Vietnam. Vietnam, we, what we were told about Vietnam is that we were winning. That's what we were told. All of us remember what we saw Every night on the news, that's one, you know, CBS, NBC, ABC, Walter Conkright, Monthly Brinkley, these are people we all know. What we saw was coffins coming home. Do you wonder why you haven't seen that in the last several wars? You haven't seen any coffins come home, have you? Not from Afghanistan, not from Iraq, not from anywhere we've been. You don't see coffins. No pictures anymore. Because one of the things that was learned about Vietnam is that you don't show that to the public. Because when you show it to the public, they say, well, this can't be good. You know, maybe they're not telling us the truth. And what happened in Vietnam, it came to pass that the realization began to dawn on the people in this country. And this is before the student movement. That we were not being told the truth about Vietnam. We just weren't being told the truth. In 1964, in the Gulf of Tonkin, there was a Navy ship. There were actually two ships there. One of them was the Maddox, right? The Maddox reported that it was fired on by the North Vietnamese. You're looking for an excuse, so I, I took a step back and tell you the excuse they used. Fired on by the, by the North Vietnamese. When you read anything, and you read the communication between the ship and another ship, and the ship and the commanders elsewhere, what you find is that's not true. That's not what happened. It's not that they made it up. It's that they thought that would happen, but that didn't happen. They used that to pass the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, which allowed all these pouring men into Vietnam. Okay. This war got worse and worse until in January 1968, the Viet Cong, who was an offshoot of the People's Army, the North Vietnamese People's Army, attacked over 100 major cities and district capitals in Vietnam inside the American Embassy. I mean, you can, you can see all this. You've gone, you can Google all this stuff and you can see the pictures that were taken there. You can see the interviews with these guys that are fighting from the outside. One of it, he says, I don't know what I'm doing here. And he's down below and Roy's firing his rifle. I don't, I don't know what I'm doing here. What am I doing here? 
what wasn't realized and understood at that point, that that was a tactical loss and destroyed the Viet Cong in Vietnam. The American public took it the other way. That was the end as far as a lot of the American public were concerned. Walter Cronkite, at some point during that period, basically said, that's it. And Walter Cronkite, if those of you who remember and watched him, was like this fatherly figure who everyone believed. Everybody watched him, everyone believed him, he was an honest guy, and he said, we're losing, we're being lied to about this war. After General Westmoreland was telling him it was his light at the end of the tunnel. After the third of the South Vietnamese presidents, three of them. So the Vietnam, Vietnam War comes to a very inglorious end with 59,000 young Americans dead. The 58, 300, I think, and there's, I think, 11 or 1,200 still missing. Okay. And several million, the figures are from 930 some odd thousand to 3 million. Vietnamese, Laotians, and Cambodians killed. So it's a devastating war, and it has some very severe consequences for the United States in terms of how you're going to conduct yourself. Out of this war comes the Pentagon Papers that we went to court with and were finally published, which basically, if you read them, it's a read. It's, for me, it was very interesting. Some of you, you go to sleep. Okay. Basically, it showed how the American government lied to the American public for all of these years. So that was kind of the end. But what it spawned, and which is really what Marvin wanted me to talk State, about, yeah. what it spawned was what happened in Kent State. And basically what I can tell you is that I told you that I went there fairly apolitical. I did. Um, but I was always very interested in politics, because history, politics, politics, history, all goes together. I was very interested, and I would, it was a big school. I came from a school of 3,000. That school, I think, when I was there, at 22 or 23,000. <coughs> I would go to these rallies and sit in the back and listen. And I heard some things that I kind of never was exposed to before, you know, like uh, lapdog of the running imperialist pig. I'll never forget that one. That was the, that's the, that, that one. That's the best one I think I thought. This, is, this is, was an, uh, an SDS thing, which, by the way, Students for a Democratic Society didn't start the way you picture them. Students for a Democratic Society, in the Port Huron statement, basically says, we want to make this country better. Here's what we've seen in our lifetime. Here's what we, we, we like to do. And it's a long statement written by Tom Hayden, basically by Tom Hayden. So I went, I did that, and I listened. And I happened to be there on a day when um, the chapter of SDS there, Students for Democratic Society, went to the president of the university's office to present him with a petition. And they opened the door, and they arrested about 20 people. And I took umbrage at that. At that point, I didn't know anybody. But I took great umbrage at the way this was done, because that's not the way I thought it should be done. So the, what happened is that some of the groups on campus, I was affiliated with none, um, decided that they were going to go to this suspension hearing of SDS. The university decided to have a hearing on whether they were going to spend SDS from the campus. And it was held in this brand new building, and it was probably 13 stories, called the Music Speech Building. I decided to go. I had made, by that point, a very good friend who was a Canadian. Um, and we went together. And we were the last ones into that building. And as we walked in, I noticed there was a police officer, campus police, on each side, and chains on the doors. And when we walked through the door, <coughs> the more more than is, I heard one of the guys on the radio, OK, they're all in now. We're going to chain the doors. They chained the doors behind us. And I went, I said to Jim, Sam Jim Stevenson, I said, well, this was planned. They planned this. Went upstairs, was there about five minutes, and somebody said the blue hats were coming. What line? you know? What's a blue hat? I don't know. It was, it was quiet police. Hmm. So this, is, this was their plan to do all this, right? So they were going to arrest everybody that was involved in this, 
And luckily enough, there was a young uh, professor there that I became uh, friendly with uh, that had a key to the elevator. And he probably got half the people down. And I decided at that point that whatever should come of this, I was going to be part of. Subsequently, over the next days, three, four, five days, um, they decided to hold a meeting in what was a commuter's cafeteria at the university. And I went to that meeting, and um, it was a raucous affair, as you can imagine. It just so happened that I had been the parliamentarian of my fraternity at Plattsburgh. So they said, a few people I had told, they said, why don't you come up here, et cetera, et cetera. You'll help. I did that. I became the leader of a group of people um, who wanted some justice done for some of this. I was affiliated with no one at that point. Uh, we eventually demanded, 10,000 of us marched on campus and demanded a vote be held, a referendum be held on all of this. At, as this is happening. Stephen, put the time frame here. How long before May 4th is this? Uh, I got there in March of 1969, so it's a year. So this incident you're talking about is a year this before. Is, the yes, yes, thank you. It's a year, this is a year before. I should, have, I should have given you that date. This is a year before. Um, I become involved and, and, and actually the head of this group. When we're planning a final march, someone comes in, there's about 20 of us meeting, comes in and, and takes me outside and said, the newspaper just printed an article that you were seen on an SDS rally last night in Akron, Ohio. And I said, well, that's impossible because I was at the vice president of the university's house last night having dinner with him. And we take a step backward now and tell you. The vice president of the university, Lou Harris, was a very, very decent man. Through a professor that I know, he related to me that he would like me to come to his house, have dinner with him, he would like to talk to me. Anyway. Okay, no problem. Went to Dr. Harris's house and he started asking me questions. And I said, and I answered exactly what I'm answering. I said, here's where I come from. This is where my father was a policeman, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I had no political affiliation, blah, blah, blah. And he said, okay. He said, you know, I believe you. He said, you know, he said, you just happen to be involved. I said, yeah. I said, because I think it's wrong. That's spawned this huge march that took place. <laughs> so a year before. I was involved and got to know a bunch of people, including some of the more radical people on campus. Not only SDS, the Yippies. Yip, 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 yippies, some of you are wrong, will know that. And, and uh, uh, Young Americans for Freedom, YAF. I mean, there were a bunch of groups like this. So I got to know these people and became friendly with some of these people. Okay. Nixon is the president uh, in, in 1968. It was far worse than Lyndon Johnson in a lot of ways. Many ways. Uh, crazier in, in a lot of ways. Um, if you know his career, you see what actually what happened to him. Um, and, and in 1964, six or seven years before this, at the University of California at Berkeley, the free speech movement starts. These, all these things are connected. Free speech movement is the students at Berkeley didn't like the campus regulation on speech. And basically, there were riots there that took place. And that became a whole movement on its own. So you had the free speech movement, you had the anti-war movement, anti-war movement, the student movement, and eventually what would become also the women's movement, all involved in this. In any event, so um, in uh, 1970, when everything starts at Kent State, and, and um, there are rumblings about doing things around the university, protesting the ROTC. All of you know what the ROTC is? You all know, right? Okay. Protesting the ROTC. And the invasion of Cambodia? Hmm? And Nixon? Yeah, but, but, before, yeah. but before that, there was, there was uh, Kent State had what was called a liquid crystal institute. It was a scientific institute that used, that, that did research for war. 
and for more um, different types of equipment used in Vietnam. So there were two things that the more radical students were aiming at. They were aiming at the liquid crystals institute, and they were aiming at they were aiming at bar <laughs> On Friday night, I was with a group of people on the campus, um, and one of them made mention of the fact that uh, there was going to be street action downtown. I had no idea what that meant. That's how naive I was. No idea at all. Everybody usually went downtown at night, went downtown. There were everybody in the streets. Everybody in the streets. All over the place. And the university and the police of Kent made it worse because they closed everything downtown. Everything. They said people had to go back to the dorms, they had to go back to the apartments, they had to go back to wherever they were, but they couldn't be or they were going to be arrested. Everybody goes back, a group gathers at the ROTC building, somebody lights it on fire. The firemen come, they start trying to put out the building, somebody cuts one of the hoses. That was the beginning of what happened on May 4th. I told you I had become known in the year previous to that. I was going to show you a picture at the bell. In the middle of the quad at Kent State is a victory bell. Always wrong when they the football team won. It's a pretty big place. During this initial process, the year I got there, when they invaded Canada, when they invaded Cambodia, myself and two other history graduate students decided to bury the Constitution, which we did. Okay. That's how I really got involved in, in all of this stuff. So it comes now to this point where they burned the ROTC building down, and Dr. Harris sends for me. He wants me to act as a mediator between the more radical students, whom he knows I know, but I'm not one of, and the university administration, he in particular. And would I carry a message from him to them? I said, sure. I will do that. And what he wanted was to set up some kind of meeting with them, you know, to talk these things over. They were way past that point. I wanted to talk to anybody. Because they felt, these, the, particularly the SDS people, felt that they had been thoroughly discredited and discriminated against, that they were right, these people were wrong, and that they didn't want to have anything to do with anybody in the university. OK. What happens that night is that um, we are asked. I'm, I, by the way, I'm a, I have a graduate fellowship there at that point. A bunch of us on the faculty, younger and older, are asked to put on blue armbands and escort the students back to their dorms after the fire, which we did. I probably had one of the more scary incidents in my life at that point because we were from about here to the wall when a group came upon a group of soldiers and we said, blue bands, we have blue band. They got down on the knee and they pointed their rifles. We, like this, immediately. Faculty marched the faculty marched the thing. <coughs> Get out of here. We left. That was the end of that. We left. On Monday, on Sunday, the, the incident happened on Monday, on, on Sunday, my father calls me. <coughs> he says to me, I want you to come home. And I said, I can't come home. I said, I'm involved in this. I said, I'm not coming home. What you're doing is wrong. I said, you taught me better than that. And he said to me, very pressing words. Someone's going to get killed. And he said that again, and I said, why do you think that? He said, because the National Guard is not prepared to deal with the kind of things they have to deal with on that campus. They need the state police. I said, Dad, I can't come home. That was the end of the conversation. The following day, everybody at 12 o'clock, there were thousands of students met at the Victory Bell. We had, when we buried the Constitution, basically said, 
We're going to have a meeting. This was before everything that took place. We're gonna, everybody's going to meet there. We rolled down there. The National Guard was called the night before. So we, they were on campus. They were surrounding the burned out ROTC building. We met there. I got uh, together with two younger faculty members and went on to the roof of the dorm, overlooking so if this is the bell tower, here is one of the dorms. We got on the roof of that dorm. And we're standing there, well, we heard very loud noises, and one of them said, firecrackers, and I said, I was familiar with, with weapons, I said no. I said, those are the rifle shots. We took off, we went down, and that's what, what we saw was the carnage that took place there. Um, my role in that, if you can Google all this stuff, by the way, in this thing, my role in that was basically, um, I tried to stop what I saw happening. And the general who was in charge of the National Guard troops, Canterbury, pulled me over to him um, and said, you need to get these people out of here. That's the part that was in Ken the Burns. Vietnam series by Ken Burns, where you come up to the policeman and he talks to you and then cut his head <laughs> and he tells you, you got four minutes. Or something like that. You yeah, you have to you have to go away. So this is a series that Ken Burns did. That I was um, overseas somewhere when this came out. Marv was not the only one. A bunch of people told me from all over the country that they had seen this. Um, so I basically got a microphone and I said, "You need to sit down." So everybody sat down. Um, at that point, one of the professors, Glenn Frank, a very well known, very nice man, very well liked man, you know, hears basically said, "Go away. You need to go away." That's when the university, they closed down the university. Um, I came home and hit out, basically. Uh, at, uh, some of you know uh, Eric Bloom, Dr. Bloom. He and I were very good friends. I stayed at his house. Um, but one of the things I did after the shooting is I picked up spent cartridges. And um, my father got a call. At that point, there was an FBI office in Monticello. I don't know if the, you, the, you guys know that or remember it, you know, or you ever knew it, but there was an FBI office in Monticello. And they called my father. And um, my father said, I got this phone call from the FBI. You know, so I said, I have nothing to say to them. He said, that's fine. He said, I'm going with you. I said, great. Went to the FBI guys and sat down. I told him I don't, you know, I don't know anything. You know, I, I was there, here was my part in it, I didn't know any people involved, et cetera, et cetera. And a piece came out in the record, Charlie Crist wrote an article, which I have in the record, about an interview that he did with me. Um, the, then, then, on top of Kent State, what happened at Jackson State, which was a black college, those students were killed there, I think, you, Maybe you folks know about that, maybe you don't. Um, so they, what they did is they put together a commission on campus unrest. And I thought it'd be instructive for just to read to you one of the things the commission said. I went on, I was on the national news. I had calls from all over the country, friends of mine from college. They chose me to you know, talk. And basically I said to them, you'll find people like me everywhere. We're not super politically inclined, we're not radicals, you're driving us into radicalism because of this war and because of the way you treat us. This is what this says. The actions of some students were violent and criminal and those of some others were dangerous, reckless, and irresponsible. The indiscriminate firing of rifles into a crowd of students and the deaths that followed were unnecessary, unwarranted, and inexcusable. That's what they had to say about what happened at Kent State University. Um, the other thing I'll show you, Stephen. and I'll take all kinds of questions. The other thing I'll tell you is that in um, 
the summer, in the spring of 1982, I was, 1983, I was in Rota, Spain. There's an enormous naval base in Rota, Spain. I was there teaching. And I got a call from a former student of mine who said she was working for the Time Life Company. And they were doing a 13 album series, book series on Vietnam. And they wanted to interview me. And I said, and they would come to Spain. And I said, it just so happens I'm coming home. So I came back. Uh, this guy spent two days with me at my parents' house. And the way I told him, the only way I was going to do this is if I could edit it. And look at it. So this is one of the volumes. And this is me. And I have eight pages next to William Westmoreland of all people. <laughs> of all people. William Westmoreland. And this is James Michener's book, Kent State, What Happened and Why. And basically what Michener did, I was very surprised. All of this surprised me. All of this kind of stuff surprised me. What Michener did, this is his book, um, was basically use me as the common man, quote unquote. Here's a student. Here's where he comes from. Here's what his beliefs are. Here's what his personality likes. So see, that's what he talks talk about my personality, et cetera, et cetera. And here's what happened at Kent State. And this is what we're doing to people like me. This is what this country and this war is doing to people like me. That was the, that's the thesis behind this book. So of these two pages of things, I think I touched on, I don't know, maybe 10, maybe more. OK. Any more? You want any more? <laughs> Your question, sure. I'm happy. I'm happy to do that. Lynn. Stephen, I grew up in Youngstown, Ohio, which is 35 miles from Kent. In 1970, I was teaching in Youngstown, Ohio. One of the four people who died at Kent State was from Youngstown, Ohio, and you may have seen much of Youngstown, Ohio in the uh, news in recent months because of job situations, etc. I was a little bit more politically active in those days. Um, the governor at the time, uh, James Rhodes, mm -hmm. the night before, Sunday, May 3rd, was quoted as saying the following. Referring to the campus protesters, he said, they're worse than the brown shirts and the communist element and also the night riders and the vigilantes. They're the worst type of people that we harbor in America. This was said by James Rhodes, you know, probably 12 hours before mm -hmm. he sent in the National Guard that ultimately killed. I believe if you were not really active, I know the young woman who, who died, who was from my hometown, was not at all involved. These were four, I think all four, were innocent bystanders. They were going to class, basically. They were not, they were not protesters. Right. But, but the really interesting thing, James Rhodes was, he had already had, I think, two years, you could only serve two consecutive terms of government. After Kent State, he was re-elected. I will just tell you that my master's thesis at Kent State, which I did not complete because they wouldn't let me complete it, was on who is blamed for this. And I don't have, I can't tell you the number of letters I wrote and, and I, I read that were truly disgusting <laughs> and about these kids. Okay, uh, I saw other people's hands. Yes. Who put that together? That was over there. Campus this one? Campus unrest. This was um, President's Commission on Campus Unrest. Oh, okay. Yes. Were any of the uh, National Guardsmen indicted or convicted? No, they, they started, no. No one was ever punished for this. <laughs> yes. Um, I, I was born on um, Tory Eisenhower. And I studied all militarism because I wanted to know how, after I read the diary of Anne Frank, how Hitler could come to power. And I studied all aspects of everything. But when my cousin went to Vietnam, 
and had to, um, be, my mother said he wrong, um, veterans told me, not a tail gunner. He was a door gunner to go down, be shot at a pickup body bags. And when they came home, and my mother said her cousin's a junkie, at least he came home and it was never the same. I was 11 in 1968. It was the worst year of my life. I was 11. My uncle came in and said, they just assassinated Martin Luther King in two guys. I'm, I'm from 1968. I'm from Jersey. I'm with a water kid shooting the people on TV. The war came home. Let's see. Jeffrey and I were at Cornell during those years. And concurrently, to, to the situation at Kent State with the Back to Africa movement that really started at Cornell University, where in, in March of, of 69, the black students took over the student union with, with bandanas and guns was on the front page of, of, the, of the Daily News and so forth. Was any of this part of the- a great point. Right. I would have forgotten, yes. But this is a great point, but the answer is no, yes, but no, and I'll tell you why. I became friendly with some other white students my age, with some of the people in the black union of students, particularly the guy, the president, his name was Leroy. In fact, he took us into New York to a party in Harlem, which I, I'd never been to. I became friends. After the shooting, I saw him, and I said something to him. He said, he said, why do you think there were no black folk there? He said, we knew they were gonna shoot you. So we knew, and he's right. There was not one black person in that crowd. Two little footnotes. One, Matt McHugh, who subsequently became our congressman, right, right. negotiated the dispersal of that crisis at Straight Hall, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. Right. And then subsequently was eventually elected a member of Congress, who represented our area. The other is Steve, which I thought you were going to mention, it wasn't just Kent State that closed. Every campus yes, in Ireland, yes. for those who don't remember, there was no, so there, there was, was a student the, strike. The year there was strike. no World Series. The, the whole country closed right. up. All the schools in the country, right. or most of them, did not have that semester finished and had to make do with a lot of other arrangements. So it was, it was sort of a conflict. It was. You know, the other thing I, I would leave you with is what I the other thing I said to my students. I went to work um, for the University of Maryland. I went to Iran in 1978. Uh, a, a local person finished a PhD, and I was looking for a job, and went to Tehran to teach elementary school, even though that my, wasn't my field. And I came back uh, from Iran, and in 1981, went to work for the University of Maryland, who I'm still working for, online in Europe. Every two months or every four months, I went to a different military base, but I didn't live on the base, I was a civilian. I could live on the base if I wanted to, but I didn't. And what I used to tell my class is, can you believe they're actually paying me to stand here and talk to you about all this? I would do it for free. And I, I said, this is what I do with my friends, and it truly is. I love this stuff. I have, I have spent my life basically reading. And Martin's right, I've traveled a lot of the world, and that I, I, I'm very thankful that I've been able to do that. I came back from Iran and went to Israel and Greece. I had never been to Europe. Went to Israel and Greece, came home in 1979. I said to my parents, I want to travel. So when I had the ability to go to Europe, I went. And I haven't stopped. I've been traveling as much as I could. My motto is, do it while you can do it. <laughs> you know, for as long, as much as you can, for as long as you can, because at some point you can. Yes. Were you in Iran at all during the Yes, that's why I left. I was there during the revolution. A friend of mine likes to say, don't ever know where Stephen is because <laughs> I swear this is the truth. Or there's going to be a revolution. Yes, I was out there in the summer of 78, and the winter of 78 started. I left on the last day of my passport. I was, the, I was the security person for the school I worked at, which was a private Iranian school funded by the Shah's wife. Um, I taught little kids who lovely, half a day in Farsi, half a day upper class kids, half a day in English. I became the security person for the school. They started meetings once a month, then they started meeting twice a month, then they started meeting every week, then they started meeting every day. I came back to school one day and I said to my colleagues, and there were about 15 of them, 
look, I said, there's going to be a revolution here. I said, just pay attention to what's around you. Look what's around you. We should really lead. Everybody left but one. I was thinking about this woman the other night. By the way, one of them was from New Falls. One of these guys from New Falls. I was thinking about this woman the other night. She put a chador around herself and disappeared into the south of Tehran. I have no idea what happened to her, but she said she was staying. But yes, yeah, so the answer is, I was there, I left, I loved Iran. What I saw came home, that was not my experience there. The people were great. <clears throat> they really were really lovely. It was just, it was a, a resurgence of Islam at the time that Iran was becoming westernized. Women were having rights, women were wearing makeup, women were wearing, you know, short skirts, and, and the people who were religious, and there were a lot of them, took umbrage at all this, and that's what, you know, in the Shah's rule, he was a dictator. Yes, ma'am? You mentioned that um, the circumstances um, <coughs> forced many of the young people to become more political than they had intended. Um, do you want to draw any parallels between then and now? <laughs> Good question. Well, I think I think there there are parallels to be drawn. I mean, there you can see that there are circumstances in this country, whether you agree or not, including, including I mean, climate change, which, I, which we're seeing here. My friend Barry called me from Phoenix. He was standing in the snow. He's lived there since 1965. It was snowing. My friend calls me from uh, from Florida and tells me it's 93 when it should be 80. We see what we see here, so that's one of the problems. The other is what's happened in this country. This is like the era, without getting heavily into politics all this, this is like the era of the robber barons, what you're seeing. The middle class has kind of made this country great, and I'm a product of that greatness, and many of you in this room are, was that there were, after the war, when this country tooled up, there were all these blue collar jobs, and they paid well. They paid well. They paid well enough so that a mother could stay home if she wanted to. And most women did stay home. Not all. My mother worked part time at different at different points. You know, because she wanted to. But yeah, there are there are parallels to be drawn. This country needs a real good going over. It's like this. I'll tell you my my view is like this. This is this is what we're looking at. It's very slow. It's a decline of the Roman Empire, basically. It's very slow. But this is what you see. We need to take ourselves in hand in this country in a lot of ways, a lot of different ways that we're not doing. Um, and one of the things that I see that disturbed me greatly is rather than make voting easier for people, we're making voting more difficult, particularly for minorities. We shouldn't be doing that. I mean, it's wrong. It's morally wrong in a lot of ways as far as I'm concerned. This whole thing going on with these laws that are being passed, you know, nobody likes the, you know, abortion. Nobody likes it. Nobody likes to think about it. Nobody likes to talk about it. But to pass some of these laws that are being passed are so outrageous in some ways that, you know, that, and this has made, you're right, this has made this younger generation much more political, much more so. I think it's a good, that was a good analogy. Yes? <clears throat> Just a point of information. On, on the uh, table in the corner, there are some books, library books on Kent State and on the 60s, and they're available if people want to look at it. And take it out. Thanks. Yes, time. Stephen, uh, my father really thought the Vietnam War was justified. And if you recall, you didn't mention this, he was put out there the domino effect. Mm -hmm. If Vietnam goes, if the whole communist effect. Right. Vietnam goes, so goes Cambodia, so goes right. Quebec. Right. And they, have, who is it? that first put that put no, that no, no, thought yeah. out. No, no, no. That was the end. And I, I, I neglected to make, I mentioned George Kennan and the payment. That came along, not from Kennan, but it came along at the same time. That exact thing, and you, you described it very well. You can't let something go because the rest of them are going to fall like dominoes. So that's the theory that they used, that you couldn't do this. And, but, and but who, I don't remember where, where it came from. And then you had, then you had uh, McCarthy. Yeah. Then you had McCall, what happened to McCarthy hearings and the blackballing of people and, and yes. telling lies about other people, ruining people's lives. I mean, this was the whole thing. This was the second time.
that this has happened. The first time this happened was in the 1920s, and it happened under the Attorney General was Palmer, it was called the Red Scare, the Palmer Red Raids. And what they did is they, they deported people. Anybody they thought was a socialist, not so much a communist at that point, they deported. Well, they the there are some who believe, and first, I, I guess we're winding down, so I want to say thank you. I know we'll close in a minute, but there are some who believe that 1968 was the beginning of what we see today. That in 68, Nixon's silent majority approach to, for example, the whole South. Lyndon Johnson said it when he passed the Civil Rights Law in 64, I mean in 68, we've lost the South to the next generation. The South was staunchly democratic for 100 years after the Civil War. So the transition from that and into what I'm calling the age of polarization began in 68 when Nixon, and of course Wallace was in the game, began playing off one side against the other for his benefit and ultimately won the election, which everybody felt if it lasted one more week, Humphrey could have won, didn't break soon enough for Johnson left. So some of the seeds, and I've read a number of books in this, you and I have talked about it, have said they were planted by the whole Nixon approach to empowering those who had not been heard from before. And much of what Trump has sort of tapped into is, in part, people who feel Washington has failed them, and nobody's listening, and we're going to give them a lesson that they're going to learn. And they're not wrong. And it began in 68. Yeah, no, I, think that's a really, I think that's a really good point. Nixon came into office saying, I have a secret plan. Yep. More men died under Nixon than Johnson. People don't know that or yes. don't remember that. But that's actually yeah, twice. So, but I mean, this was, I think that was a very good point that Marvin made uh, about all this. Because if you, if, you, if you watch politics at all, you understand where the anxiety and the angst is coming from, from these people who support Donald Trump, and in fact, they have been failed. They have, we, this country has failed them. The Democratic Party has failed them. Because the jobs don't exist, they're not being, and there's another thing that's involved in this, and it's racial. This country, like it or not, in 20 years is gonna be majority, I like to call it pan. <laughs> It, 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 you see it, I mean, you see it everywhere. You see all of these marriages and these relationships taking place that are interracial and interreligious. You see it more and more and more and more. And maybe the only good thing, or one of the good things that will come out of that is the prejudice will stop. Of all this prejudice that we see. But I think that was a really good point. Yes? Okay, um, like you, but without the leadership part, I knew a lot of the SCS people when I was at Cornell. And I remember going to one of their meetings once, and there had been some sort of high school protest or uprising in Syracuse, which is, I don't know, 50, 70, whatever miles from Cornell. And their reaction was, this is very good. We should support this. But we should teach them the real dialect of what they are for, not what they think they're protesting about. Mm -hmm. And I remember my reaction was something is very wrong here. But it goes to your answer, yes or no answer to less, that there were th things going on that may have been parallel, but they weren't really intersecting right. and, you know, the same thing. Good comment. You're right. Yes, yes sir. Was, uh, before you leave uh, the Kent State situation, I was just reading a recent article on the actual events that were taking place. You talked about politics, and I have a question about that. My first son was born with Charlie Lyman My first son. Shh. I'm telling you this morning. So I want to hear from you if you can throw some light on the actual event of the shooting. Well, yeah, I, I, I mean, basically what is standing there, basically what happened is I think the guards went panicked. I think they saw all these students, and the students were swimming. They, they, what they did is they got to a Jeep. The, they had a driver, a guy next to them, and a guy with a bullhorn. And they said, uh, through, through the megaphone, through the loudspeaker, everybody needs to leave. And what they got was F you, stones thrown at them, all of them get off our campus, you don't belong here. This, this whole thing. 
and went back to the lines and started firing tear gas. And some of the students picked up the tear gas. You see it, you know, when you see in Venezuela and all these other crazy places, we took the tear gas back. And I, they panicked. And for somebody, and there's been a lot of speculation, I think it was probably the lieutenant in charge from the stuff I have read, gave the order to fire. They knelt down the fire. That's exactly what happened. And it was that fast. It was that fast. So the, the mentality of actually shooting people with real bullets instead of uh, rubber bullets or some other aspects of that. Well, th that, that, yeah, that, and, and I think, you know, these guys, those gas masks, you look at those, you really can't see very much through the gas masks. They had to be scared to death. They were young, they, they weren't much older, they were the same age as the kids they were shooting at. It was this the whole generation, you know, and, and they got frightened, and they shot. And then, you know, Dean Keller got paralyzed, and these four kids died for, you know, no reason at all. Never should have happened. But, but Lynn, I'm glad Lynn brought up Rhodes, because I listened to that speech. You know, he, he, he was a disgusting human being. What, what really shocked me and, and made me ask that question about parallels, that as much as Rhodes was despised by the young people, he was reelected. He was he, he was a favored son in Ohio. And it makes me just a tad afraid of the next year. That people who have done some terrible things may get reelected. Yeah, we see that we've seen that, haven't we? We've been watching yes, sir. You might want to think of a future lecture here. When you, the very first point you made about what kind of country we are and how that compares to what we are today. Well, well, when you teach American history, you know, up until a certain point, if you remember that, you understand a lot about why the United States behaved as it did. I would probably, if I were teaching now, I would probably modify that, some, that somewhat. You know, because the values in this country have changed drastically, I don't have to tell you, you know, in, in pretty much every way, some for the better, some for the worse. But that is, that's what I always tell my students. This is, you know, I want to understand American history, understand this. And by the way, one of the very interesting things is they talk about Christianity, and, and I saw that in the paper. I re, I like, I, I'm a, a voracious paper reader, and I like paper, paper, so I like the Democrat. And a woman, I believe, in the Democrat wrote a letter. I think it was the Democrat, not the record, wrote a letter basically saying that um, the United States has always been a Christian country. It actually has not always been a Christian country because the founding fathers were deists. So, it, you know, not quite, but there was enough Christianity, you know, to, for me to make that comment. Yes, I saw somebody else's hand. Yes, Barbara. Well, I would like to go back to the point about um, the young people today versus the young people. Um, I've been told that the reason we didn't change the world is because we were so angry. And the young people today are not as angry, but they're serious. We didn't vote. I mean, I always voted, but a lot of people, a lot of my friends, they didn't believe in the system. They weren't going to vote. So that's why these people got elected and re-elected. My candidates always lost the government. <laughs> <laughs> remember, the line, remember the line, Humphrey Nixon, killed. Humphrey Nixon, what's the difference? No, seriously. Yeah, that I was, yeah. That was I what we yeah. heard. That's one of the reasons he lost. That's one of the reasons yeah. he lost. Yeah. There was no difference. Yeah. And this, you know, I, and with a lot of people today, there's no difference. Certain points, yes. That you won in a landslide the second election. And yeah. A landslide. yeah, because none of the young people voted. It was just a well, silent majority. And I thought Marvin's, Marvin's point was very well taken. They really want is that people won for, you for the same reason that Trump won. Yeah. It's yeah. the people that believe yeah. they're not being heard. And right. I said, but it's different now. now the young so, well, this was fun. It was a little, uh, a little.